The date was August the 2nd, primary day in Kansas for the 2022 midterm cycle. And front and center was not the candidates for office, but abortion. It was the first statewide referendum on abortion rights since the Supreme Court ended the constitutional right to an abortion in the Dobbs case back in June. With momentum seemingly in their favor, abortion rights opponents hoped that Kansans would help advance their cause. They hoped that Kansans would vote to remove abortion protections from their state's constitution. But Kansans did the opposite. In a Trump plus 15 state, in a very red state, they voted resoundingly by 17 points to keep those abortion protections in place. Suddenly, Republicans across the nation realized they'd made a mistake something Democratic Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal spoke to me about the day after the Kansas vote. The extreme Republicans who have been pushing this anti-abortion message, who have installed these Supreme Court justices that are absolutely out of sync with the rest of the country and overturning these constitutional rights that have been settled law for 50 years, completely underestimate the fury and the wrath of people across this country, of women across this country. And the country felt that fury. Dobbs set off a wave of new voter registrations among women, especially rising by 35% across several states. In Kansas, women made up a whopping 70% of all new voters. Women also turned out in high numbers on election night. And the result? Voters in every state that put abortion on the ballot chose to preserve the right to choose, from reliably blue California all the way to bright red Kentucky. Not only did America's women send a big message on abortion rights, they were pivotal to preventing the predicted red wave. Now, to be clear, the fight to preserve abortion rights isn't over, nor is the U.S. by any means the only place we saw women fighting for their freedoms this year. We saw in China, too, in those massive protests against COVID lockdowns, women were at the forefront holding up blank sheets of paper, a major symbol of the protest in a country that shows little tolerance for dissent. And as Hong Kong-born journalist Lita Hong Fincher told me in late November, for the women on the front lines, this was about more than just COVID. Young women in particular have been uh, really upset for many, many years, even prior to the pandemic because of this much worsening gender inequality. Many different kinds of gender discrimination have intensified. Despite heavy government crackdowns, nevertheless, women persisted, just as they've done in Iran. Women there have been leading an uprising in the months after the death of Masa Amini, who died after being detained by the so-called morality police for allegedly violating Iran's dress code. Iranian women have taken to the streets chanting, women, life, freedom. They've burned hijabs and cut their hair. And as Iranian-American writer Hoda Katabi told me last fall, these protests were not a matter of religion. At the core of this is not just hijab, mandatory hijab, and not just um, dress code, but a, a larger like critique of the state as it exists right now. Um, and I think the, the chant that you also mentioned earlier in the program of women, life, freedom, I, I think speaks to the, the, the broadness and the intensiveness of the demands that Iranians are making right now with women at the forefront. Even in the midst of violent crackdowns, thousands of arrests and sadly some executions, the women of Iran show no signs of slowing down their demonstrations. Women everywhere are saying our bodies are ours, our choices are ours, enough is enough. They've been saying it for ages. And until the governments and societal structures that seek to repress them cease to exist, women will resist. Joining me now, Christina Greer, Associate Professor of Political Science at Fordham University and Rula Jibrail, Foreign Policy Analyst and Visiting Professor at the University of Miami. Thank you both for coming back on the show. Christina, let me start with you. Without women voters, there would have been a Republican red wave this year, would there not? It's women who helped the Dems defy political history, basically. And Betty, dare I say, black women. You know, in political science, we often talk about a gender gap. But when we look at the data and we disaggregate it, you know, it's black women who actually skewed the data because they're so overwhelmingly Democratic. Uh, the second largest Democratic yes. voting bloc is black men. And then a distant third is Latinos and Asians. And then at the bottom tier, we have white women and white men. Uh, so we, you know, yes, women did save democracy in many ways, but I, I want to be a little more specific uh, and yes. say that black women have been the canaries in the mine and continue to be the canaries in yes. the mine, alerting the country and the world as to the dangers that lie ahead. 
Very good point. Rola, unfortunately, coverage of all movements, uh, that coverage is not created equal. Actress Jessica Chastain called out the double standards in how our media talks about various conflicts around the world. She told uh, Marie Claire, I've done a lot of press recently and a lot of people want to talk about Ukraine, but when I bring up Iran, no one wants to talk about that. When asked why she thinks that is, she didn't flinch. She says, I think because it's a woman-led revolution and I think because Ukraine is mostly white people. How important is it for a person like her to call this out? I think it's very important, Mahdi. I mean, one of the most important quotes that we've been repeating, especially to our colleagues in the media and, and, and to politicians around the world, if you care about human rights violations only when the enemies, your enemy, commits them, then you really don't care about human rights violations. Exactly. And we keep hearing the stories from Ukrainian women uh, who go to Poland and basically they're denied abortion. But then we keep hearing a lot of stories from Iranian women who are detained and raped in jail. And their story doesn't don't get the same coverage and the same outrage by the international media. And above all, from the politicians who in this moment are still struggling. Now. What kind of reaction they have when Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, basically arrests human rights activists, women rights activists, like, you know, many of the people that we know of. And then they torture them, rape them in jail. And then they are willing to talk about Iran, but they were not willing to do more than talking. And when it comes to Saudi Arabia, they basically shrug it off. Yes. It is fascinating that globally women are protesting and yet we're kind of boxing women into different categories. Are these women protesting against countries and governments we like or don't like? Are they protesting for things we like or don't like? Christina, as much as abortion galvanized women at the polls here in the U.S., it won't be enough to codify abortion rights at a federal level, especially with the House gone. President Biden urged voters to help get two more senators, only to admit after the election that there likely still won't be enough votes to codify next term. What happens now? What happens in terms of the fight for abortion rights? And it can't be left to women alone, can it? Yeah. No, it absolutely can't. You know, and many, I think that, you know, when, when parents wake up and realize, you know, the Republican strategy of making women uh, carry children to term, it's like they will have some real financial ramifications, not just for women, but for men too. You know, if you're saying that, uh, you know, a, a child's life begins at uh, inception or conception, um, you know, then does that mean that a woman can file for child support at that moment? Uh, you know, because Republicans believe in ripping out the social safety net from underneath society, uh, then what are the the financial uh, ramifications of some of their policies? But I I do think, though, Betty, you know, the 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 interesting kind of historical narrative is that Republicans have been working very diligently for the past 50 years yeah. to overturn Roe v. Wade from 1973. And I think Democrats have to be just as aggressive uh, and, and methodical yeah. and dedicated and as Republicans have been, you know, especially on lower level courts. Uh, you know, Joe Biden, Joe Biden really does need to, to put more justices uh, on these lower level and courts. I, and the I way apologize Trump if we're cutting you right. off. I'm cutting Sorry. you off, Christina, only because we've got less than 60 seconds left. I want to bring Rula in quickly to say Iran has just been ousted from the UN Commission on the Status of Women. Is that enough? Is there other things the international community can be doing? We've got very little time left. Sorry. Absolutely not enough. We need to support this revolution. Uh, Iran the Iranian people are one of the most incredible people. They're asking for democracy, for freedom, for dignity, for basic human rights. We cannot continue to say, yeah, the Ukrainians... We need to support the Ukrainians and, and, and help them. But the Iranians and, and, and the Egyptians and others, no. We need to be consistent. Otherwise, the fight actually is not about, you know, democracy, really. It's about somehow interest. And, and this is one of the main reasons why when we talk about women's rights in the United States or, or, or yeah. you know, the, the fight for human rights globally, if Democrats yes. don't lead that charge... We can't rely we on do. Republicans because we know where they we, stand. We, we know what they did. We can, we, bin we can definitely and Kushner and others. We can definitely end by saying we can't rely on the Republicans. I apologize for pressing you on time. The end segment, the end guested segment of the end show of the year. I apologize. You were both great as ever. Christina Greer, Rula Jibril, thank you both.